Uh, we were talking about um, when we were, we were having a conversation earlier, and I, I, I really made the, the conversation be sad. Um, but I started talking about human misery. And that's kind of the theme, one of the themes of this book is uh, we're saying, I'm like a Johnny Appleseed of sadness. Um, and the, the, this is, this is uh, one of my students um, uh, lost his father and his son on, on like pretty much within a very short time. And so we started going to the Norton Simon and other museums around. We started writing poems about, about artwork. Um, and that's what this whole thing is about. It's, a, it's an infrastructure collection. Um, but then we were reading it for the first time two weeks ago um, to a crowd and re realized everything's sad. So I'm sorry if you go home depressed, you know. Uh, but um, maybe I'll try to find something funny to say later. Um, <laughs> uh, and okay, so the first one is they're, they're all named for the, the painting. This is Owl with Chair, Ochre Background by Pablo Picasso. Picasso's owl follows you home and sits on the back of your chair. He is there now, witness to your many failures, witness to all you do. You laugh or cry or shout or sing or figure out the Rubik's Cube, and he will see it all. Do anything you want. You are no more than the collection, your collection of failures. He sees them all. He remembers. Right. Uh, Picasso being a very up guy. Um, and <laughs> I wanted, I wanted to get happy, so I started looking at Edward Hopper paintings, which, uh, yeah. <laughs> and I realized how much I just, like, I love Edward Hopper's paintings, but I just hate him. He's just a terrible human individual. He's like a, a sociopath on, on, on the wall. Um, and uh, so we, we did a whole bunch, bunch of uh, uh, Edward Hopper paintings. Um, and it turned out to be a long discussion about uh, social ills and things, and which was kind of wonderful to, to work with, with Jeffrey on that. Uh, this is called uh, Summer Interior by Edward Hopper. No one could ever paint the box of light on a floor created by a window when the room is unlit the way Hopper could. No one else could paint the bare surfaces of a bedroom completely uncluttered by passions, left as meaningless as the human soul, not even painted evenly but left in streaks because in the end what does any of it matter? No one else could ever paint the beautiful isolation of the modern. Her top is cut, is deeply cut, and yes, she's naked from the waist down, but the beautiful world of the outside is reflected on her face, which is turned to the ground so we cannot even see it. This is called um, Nighthawks uh, by Edward Hopper. After spending the day with Hopper, I learned loneliness in a way I never have before. Not what isolation is, the way it looks on other people. Like when you watch a man and a woman not talk to each other, and they also are not talking to their waiter, or that lonely guy who works so hard all day he has to wait until midnight to get a meal. That isolation creeps into you, spreading the way darkness moves across Hopper's canvas until nowhere is fully lit, except for that one bit of wall where nothing's happening. Um, and this, this is uh, Office at Night by Edward Hopper. Um, this brought me back. My, my dad, um, I was born in the Netherlands to, to American parents, and my dad uh, would bring us back. But uh, for some reason, when I was 12, he wanted to teach me about human misery. So he took me, like, downtown Amsterdam, and, you know, my, he was, like, pointing out, that's a prostitute, and she probably is addicted to drugs, and there's somebody who's really down. It's like... It was just the most miserable <laughs> experience. And then he said, meet prostitutes and things. Um, uh, I'm not sure why I did that. Well, I, I come to a conclusion here. This is Office at Night by Edward Hopper. Hopper loved Paris, but I wonder if he ever made the trek to Amsterdam. His office worker stands in her blue dress, framed by the giant window on display, standing the way Dutch sex workers stand in their windows, waiting for unchecked desire. Years ago, my father led me through the city telling stories about desperation and loneliness and the men who fed not only on sex, but the pain of, of women whose visas were stamped with poverty. Sin to, sin to him was the pleasure of their pain. Hopper teaches the same lesson of emptiness in an office where life for this woman reaches the midpoint of hope and perhaps behind her a, a, a man and a woman lurk in the dark. She will dry, draw the eyes of passing salesmen but then her job is done. When she's no longer young enough to wear the, her shoulders bare, perhaps she too will become a woman of the shadows. Perhaps not. Perhaps this is the last moment Hopper will have any use for her at all. Good. You're passing up the good ones. Yeah, well, the, all the happy ones. <laughs> mm, okay. How about, how about El Greco? 
Not a lot of people know this, but El Greco is actually Spanish for the Greco. <laughs> <laughs> this is Saint, <laughs> Saint Joseph and the Christ Child by El Greco. Christ clings to his adopted father's legs, finding the comfort and love only he can provide. Soon enough, Joseph, Joseph will be forgotten as Christ's Freudian battle rages in our favor. And what will Joseph do in his retirement years? Putter around his carpentry shop, I hope. Plane a door for a neighbor, put in a window down the road, smiling his far off smile the whole time, dreaming about all the fun his, his, all the fun his son is having down in Galilee. Think about how, how far his little boy has come. Uh, <laughs> do you want, do you want some, something French or something by Bruegel? Where you want to go to Bre Okay, okay. This is uh, uh, more, more Christy po poetry. Uh, this is Landscape with the Flight into Egypt by Pr Peter Bruegel the Elder. Bruegel's Egyptian landscape is a fairy tale, rich, cool-looking forests and alpine mountains rising in the background. The backdrop a, might, a man might imagine for his deity if he'd never been to Egypt, but had fallen in love with Switzerland. What the hell, I've never been to Egypt either, so maybe Bruegel was right. Anyway, we should all construct landscapes for our gods, put them in the worlds we love best. Zora Astor on, on the streets of Los Angeles. Zeus hanging out in a hopelessly twee pub. <laughs> that, that's one of the landscapes I like the best. Okay, you want Chagall or Picasso? Chagall, Chagall. okay, this is a, this is a um, sonnet uh, about Chagall. Chagall. I, and I, I did a whole series of sonnets in here about uh, picturing Odysseus, who I think is just a, a horrible human being. Um, thank God he's fictional. Um, <laughs> but this is Chagall's conception of it. Uh, the world of Chagall's Odysseus is a pastel wonderland where pink horses clomp, ha happily forgiving the forces that killed the, their, their sleeping Thracian riders. Those men who populate his land stand arm in arm, seemingly caught in a song of praise and joy as though nothing is wrong or could be, touched as they have been by this man. It is a world of classical buildings and laurel trees, all celebrate the hero. This is the Odysseus we are told to see, a strong, capable man, posing as though for a statue. Those he butchered know they were just props to help the story unfold. And uh, you, know, you know the story about the Thracian riders? He waits till everybody goes to sleep and then he slits their throats. Yeah. Um, okay, um, we did a, a series of, of things by uh, Degas, who I absolutely love, and he's, he's one of my, my heroes. And I don't know if you know the stories of Degas' ballerinas. Uh, some people do, some don't. Um, but he, Degas was painting these ballerinas, and you get close, they're not beautiful. They're not meant to be beautiful. Um, uh, from a distance, they're, they're beautiful, but it's the closer you get, the, the more cared and tired and, and you can see on their faces. Because these were, were children who were, worked you know, 12, 15 hours a day, uh, so that they could become prostitutes. And the ballets were largely um, buffets for rich men uh, to, to go and see. So, so Degas is, is engaged in a sort of large social discussion of, about what was happening in France at the time. Um, and uh, a lot of people became very angry as he realized what he's doing. Uh, and so these are some sonnets and things about, uh, about Degas. And being you know, from, from the San Gabriel Valley, you go to the, the Norton Simon all the time, and there's just Degas everywhere. It's just absolutely just stunning stuff including my, my favorite statue. Um, anyway, this is The Tub by Ed, Edgar Degas. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, this is Women Ironing by Edgar Degas. Jeffrey wrote The Tub, so I'm not gonna bother. <laughs> <laughs> Women Ironing. Um, Women die slowly of rich men here. The men just out, out of the painter's reach. Women married young and kept quiet with bo bottles of wine, and young girls made dancers and actors, filled with champagne while raped out of virginity. Mutiny is the next logical step, after all. So Degas makes the bottle the star of the scene. Um, uh, this is Degas' nudes. This is another sonnet. While Gauguin's naked child brides played on beaches and Duchamp had his models descend a staircase, Degas made his women towel off in the corner, had them stand fighting cold, just another work day, ignoring the strange little man who'd set up his easel. They're as, confident as, they're, as confident as, they're as confident exposed as portraited nobles, bored with prying voyeurs, and, and they don't have the time. Degas' women have things to do. 
No moment to recline upon a chaise lounge or frolic with satyrs when there's ironing waiting. And, they are children, and there are children just outside the room. There, there are women Degas loved, too tough and too busy for fear. This is my favorite statue. It's um, uh, The Little Dancer, aged 14 by Edgar Degas. Um, and this, this cr created a, a sensation in Paris and nearly got him, uh, he got him in trouble with a lot of people uh, because his, his dancer, you, could, you can see her pain. Um, if you go into the Norton Simon, she's the one who actually has a, dr a, a tutu on. It's a cloth tutu. Um, and it starts with a, a, a quotation. Uh, commemorators like Vincenti and Mahalan refer, referred openly both to the, the appearance and private behaviors of individual balla ballerinas. Their published remarks uh, about elegant knees, large lips, and in dancers, en bon, en bon point, is there? Okay, offered a virtual directory of available charms. And that's Richard Kendall said that. Socialites loathed De Degas for his dancer. Those who thought the statue was of a real girl hated her in her exercise clothes, unwashed, looking tired. They wanted her elegant, charming, re willing, ready for, for them. Fourteen was the age when they were no longer called rats, when they were forced to go on the stage for pre dances before the men who would buy them. I hope he truly was their protector, the only man in that world who, who'd stand for them, who kept his hands off these children. Even today around me, this afternoon in the gallery, she stands patiently as people bend to look up her skirt. Really depressing? Really depressing? Okay, okay, so we're gonna call, this is the departure part one and two. Uh, <laughs> Who's the artist? Uh, Picasso. Oh. Yeah, so we're just circling the drain of sadness here. Uh, the Departure, Pablo Picasso, part one. Pablo, have you seen this one? This is uh, a, a knight, and he's got this really thick uh, like armor on, and his neck's being choked, and it's just a wonderful depiction of, of, the, of a knight. Pablo leaves nothing identifiably human on his knight. Why would he? Those who watch him go smile benignly with love. Where is it? Naivete. The two are often married. Perhaps they smile because they are as happy as he was to see soldiers wrap themselves up in their steel, pick up their pointy toys, and canter out of town. And this is the departure, Pablo Picasso, part two. Pablo, who had seen the Spanish Civil War at World War I and World War II, forced their rough love on Europe, describes the BDSM of war in the tight neck brace choking his night out. Metal is the fetish of every rich man who pushes us to war. Metal in the release of the bomb or the lance or that beautiful plume of mustard gas. So, uh, yeah, I know, it's just sad. Um, we, I think we have time for one more. So how about, we want to just randomly choose one? Be, maybe somebody yell between 20 and 120? 89. 89. Oh, I could do that. Damn it, it's Jeffries. Jeffries. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you don't hear Jeffries? Uh, okay, okay. Uh, Jasper Johns. Uh, uh, oh, I have no Jasper Johns. I love him so much, too. Um, I'm going to read Green Sunset. This is, this is not a depressing poem. This is from my, my book, The Green Sunset. This is about when I felt my, my son move um, inside uh, his mother, but it wasn't this person. It was going to be my adopted son, um, and she lived with us. And it gets depressing later because uh, I didn't get that child. But this is a really happy poem, so. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it'll make the happy poem sad. Uh, this is called The Green of Sunset. I saw your sonogram this morning, heard your heartbeat for the first time, and it got me thinking about life, how long it is, how much happens to one person. I wish you health and happiness, of course, but thinking about you 50 years from now, I mostly hope the world would not make you disappointed and bitter. If life does beat you down, I hope you realize bitterness comes only from moments that stick out on our minds like pustules on a tongue. We chew on them, give them an importance they don't have to have, forget that anything else exists. I hope you remember there are good times too, beautiful times, and more importantly, there are those times, there are those moments in between the good and the bad. That's what life is, those moments in between, like when a sunset goes from orange to green. People forget the green of sunset because it's not as dramatic as the orange burst at, at, at the end of the day or the void of black at the beginning of the evening. But it's there for a second we all ignore. If you find you have become bitter on your 50th birthday, 
I want you to dwell not so much on the great loves and graduations as on, as on the trip to the supermarket when you had a craving for kiwi fruit, or the long walk home from school when you just thought about your day. I hope you remember that there are so many green moments you will have forgotten, as you will most certainly forget what happens today. For these moments inside your mother, these moments you will not be able to remember, are just as important and just as real as any other moment. Today you dance inside your mother because she drank orange juice. If you ever become bitter, remember that there was a moment today when we all watched you dance your orange juice dance and listen to your orange juice heart. And though you cannot remember it, you heard your father's voice through the thin flap of your mother's stomach as he said, my beautiful child, I love you, I love you, I love you.